Welcome back. I'm Frances O'Grady. I'm the General Secretary of the TUC in the UK, and we are the hosts for L7. And a very big welcome back from me. This is a, a very short closing session. We've heard through the whole programme from some inspiring, brilliant speakers, and we've got for this 30 minute session. Um, I guess what we've heard over uh, these sessions is really a reminder of the power of our argument, but also a reminder of the argument of our power and the importance of strength in unity, because working people across the G7, across the G20, across the world will always have more in common than divides us. <clears throat> So I'm really pleased uh, that Pierre Habard uh, has agreed to speak. He is the General Secretary of the Trade Union Advisory Group to the OECD, TUAC. Uh, I think it's safe to say that Pierre really knows his way around international institutions and how to influence and, more importantly, how to get our voice heard some action as a result. So, Pierre, for your closing thoughts. Thank you, Francis, and uh, thank you and uh, to you uh, and uh, to the TUC team for organizing this um, the summit. It does help a lot to have a, a strong labor movement and a, a strong trade union center like the British TUC uh, to help reach out uh, to government uh, uh, and to help bring uh, to convene our message to uh, to a forum like the uh, G7, as you mentioned, perhaps the uh, the two act, the good old two act, the Trade Advisory Committee has been covering the G7, G8, G7, depending on the uh, the period, since the very very early beginning in in I think in 1976, and so we have accumulated a number of statements. We have a institutional memory in the. In, uh, in helping convening the, the trade union priorities uh, to, to this forum uh, in partnership with the TUC, but also in, in partnership with the uh, ITUC, Owen and Sharon has been on the call, have been on, the, uh, on this conference. I will try to do, uh, it's an impossible task to come up with, with a wrap up or uh, 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 to, con to, to conduct a wrap up exercise for the many conversations we've had over, over, over the two days. I'll just pick a, a few, a few keywords and thoughts uh, the, 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 that were brought up uh, virtually uh, uh, during uh, this uh, two-day uh, um, a meeting. Unsurprisingly, this is a training forum uh, in the middle in the middle of a pandemic and the worst possible crisis we've had in the, in modern history. Uh, there is we want government the G7 to bring a strong focus on quality jobs and on collective bargaining. Uh, and quality jobs has a meaning; it should have substance. Collective bargaining, we know what it is. Quality jobs, we know what it is, and we will want government to agree on the, on a clear definition. Uh, quant we want quantity, but also quality job. Secondly, uh, stress democratic values. Uh, this is something where, in a sense, uh, the G7 would be fit for purpose. Uh, we, uh, it's supposed to be a like-minded uh, a, a forum. It should be. We should make best use of this forum to stress uh, the need to protect democracy. Uh, several of you, Richard Trunk at the beginning uh, yesterday, brought that up. At the, uh, at the basis, at, uh, at the start of everything, we have democracy. We need to protect that and to promote that. Uh, as we know, it has been threatened. It is uh, under severe pressure, so to speak, outside the G7, within the G7 a bit as well, let's say. Uh, but beyond that, ensuring also strong uh, a strong workers' voice uh, to end racism and to address inequalities of opportunity, inequalities uh, of power. And you, Francis, you brought that up as well. On the economic front, uh, there was a shared agreement to create an investment plan to restore trust. Uh, we have a good concrete example with the Biden administration uh, uh, recovery uh, uh, recovery plan. Uh, what a change, so to speak, from from uh, from the previous U.S. administration, and to move to a more equitable growth, obviously, but a more green recovery to create good jobs. We had a long conversation as well on uh, on those on vulnerable group on the people who are most hit by the crisis. Uh, our colleagues from Ringo, 
uh, to, uh, calls for bet to better protect those who are most hit uh, by the crisis, women. I think that was a, a fairly uh, 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 telling figure uh, from Japan. 33% of, uh, uh, of women cannot find a job after dismissal. Uh, but also migrant workers, obviously the informal uh, in the, um, economy. This, uh, uh, the impact of the crisis uh, is multi-front. Uh, there is a, a, job, a job crisis that is looming. There is an, it's an economic crisis. It could too soon become uh, a, a financial crisis, but it is also a crisis that is affecting our mental health. Uh, there again, we had uh, uh, some some figures about the rise of suicide, about the rise of a, of a, of a, uh, and the need for more psych support. It was also a two-day conversation where we we didn't reinvent the wheel, but we brought back a conversation on on essential services and public services. Uh, we know that this crisis has exposed, has, we have, have, have come up with uh, a, a new term, not a new term, but come up up front, uh, the notion of essential workers uh, who've been there at the front line. Uh, and we've exposed also perhaps uh, the gap between this essentiality of those workers, front line, second line, uh, and uh, their living condition, their working uh, condition. Uh, it brought also a. Uh, we also brought focus on essential services, healthcare, the healthcare sector, uh, sector transport, uh, energy, and perhaps more broadly, the need to recognize public services. A word, a term, a concept: public services, quality public services. That sadly enough is not necessarily uh, recognized uh, as a priority in international. Uh, Forums. But let me also come back to the fight against the current pandemic. There was a uh, load of conversation, discussion on the on vaccine inequality, inequality in access, and the need to support the World Health uh, Organization as the leading forum uh, in the fight against uh, the ongoing uh, pandemics. But not only, this is not only about uh, mobilization, about uh, funding, it's also about rights intellectual property rights. So there were also called for for the other forum, the well-known, the, the WTO, uh, to move ahead uh, and activate a, a waiver on uh, on intellectual property rights when it comes to, to vaccines, to facilitate. And as, as always, when it comes to crisis, the labor movement stand there with discussion on, uh, uh, on the recovery package and the reform that we need for the future. There was some discussion on tax, uh, uh, also on the financial transaction tax, discussion of wealth tax, tax for for uh, on digitalization. We revisited a number of discussion again on uh, on how to build a better supply chain, uh, revisit discussion on trade, on investments, and also perhaps take advantage of the improved political economy uh, uh, at the G7 with the new U.S. administration to accelerate and deepen our transition to a to a more to a low carbon economy. Clearly, from a training point of view, this means bring back the notion of just transition uh, at the heart uh, 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 of this uh, of this uh, discussion. There is a climate race, but there is also also, also a job race, uh, as uh, Sharon um, uh, uh, mentioned. But then, and Francis, if I may, I'll come back to you on that. Uh, we agree we need to build back better, but build back better from what? We need to bring a bit of per perspective here. From scratch, we're not starting from zero. There is 10 years of erosion of labor market institutions. There's erosion of, of workers' power, of the power of trade unions, and erosion of bargaining power. This is something we need to tell. I mean, we need to tell. This is something international organization, the G7, uh, uh, need to address uh, and, and from there to take action. There is perhaps also some, this is also a perhaps a zero sum game between the erosion of workers' power and the fact of the matter, which is increasing risk for political uh, capture by corporation uh, in the context of increasing corporate concentration. We are in a world where there is a whole chunk of the economy which is growing in power, economic power, financial power, political power, uh, and which is waving on the digitalization wave. Uh, and the, uh, uh, the issue here is not only economic, it is also an issue of democracy. So from there, uh, there is always this question of what is the role of the G7? I understand I was not there, but Guy Ryder brought that back. Uh, 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 brought that up. Uh, the G7 forum can 
be a force for good to build to support multi multilateralism, which has been uh, under severe pressure of, over the last four years. Clearly, there is some sunshine when uh, coming from the from the United States with the new administration, but it would be perhaps too easy to reduce a looming crisis of multilateralism just to a single country, uh, the U.S. So there is. Uh, uh, there is a role for the G7 to support the very principle of multilateralism. But there again, multi multilateralism for what? For what is the purpose? And there, Francis, you brought that up again. You brought that we need to build a new interna internationalism, uh, including revisiting all topics uh, that we have. And there, the, uh, uh, we would hope that, uh, that uh, the G7 as a form can have a role. The issue with the G7 is not necessarily, uh, and we would not want that to happen, to be a forum for the purpose of a global elite for a handful of countries to decide on the direction of, uh, of the planet. The role of the G7 can be, on the other hand, to be a force for good, a forum that can trigger change, positive change, building on the like-mindedness uh, of the countries that form uh, this group. We saw it in 2015 with the German presidency of the G7, which will take over the presidency next year when it comes to responsible business conduct. We saw it in 2017 with the Italian presidency, which brought back the discussion on the future, uh, uh, on the future of work. In 2018 with the Canadian presidency, uh, we'll focus on climate and on gender equality. Much of the gender equality agenda that we have today stems from the Canadian presidency. And uh, in 2019, to some extent with uh, the French presidency, which uh, brought a, a, a term, a concept uh, uh, at the level of the G7. It's called social dialogue, tripartism. Uh, also a, a broad discussion on uh, on inequalities. So, Francis, we will have a summit. I mean, and colleagues, there will be a summit, a, uh, a head of state summit of the G7 uh, on the 11th and 13th uh, of June uh, under, under the British presidency. Uh, let's hope for the best, again, for a G7 that can, uh, that can create positive dynamics, trigger change, and which can then be used and be exploited, enhanced in other forms, um, the OECD, uh, the WHO, when it comes to vaccine. Uh, also on topic like racial justice, uh, if the G7 could give a mandate uh, to promote a, a new agenda on that front, uh, that would be, uh, I think, uh, much, uh, much welcome. But last but not least, and uh, 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 there is this bread and butter issue matter for us, uh, uh, the labor movement, uh, which is uh, build back better, yes, build back labor market institutions better. Yes, for sure. Thank you. Thanks again for all of you. Back to you. Pierre, and thank you for all the wisdom and also the massive amount of work you do uh, for the trade union movement internationally. Um, our next and final speaker is Amil Lebendulu, uh, who is the UK Deputy Director for uh, the UK Treasury and the Sherpa for G the G20. Um, you're really welcome, Emil, and I'm not talking about you personally, of course, but just to remind our viewers uh, that many, many top civil servants are trade union members too. Thank you very much, Francis. Um, first of all, let me thank you for the invitation to be a part of this summit today and to extend apologies on behalf of Jonathan Black, uh, my boss, the UK Sherpa, um, who, along with Vanessa, the G7 Sue Sherpa, is, is, in, um, is in Washington this week having uh, conversations with, as Pierre said, uh, the, 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 the kind of newly multilateralized uh, US administration. Um, my role within the Sherpa team here in the cabinet office is as the G20 Sue Sherpa, but I also obviously plug into a lot of the issues that are coming up in, in the G7 agenda. And can I also just say, um, how important engagement groups are to our uh, the, the success of our presidency. It's so important to have um, independent expert voices, such as all of you from the from the Labour Seven, from the L Seven, adding to the policy debate and coming up with constructive um, suggestions and engagement that can help us move forward on our G Seven journey. And, and just to pick up on a couple of the points that, that Pierre made before I started. I mean, so first of all. 
Um, absolutely, the role of the G7 is not to be an elite club lecturing the rest of the world on what should happen. That is, that is, that will not work, and that is not how the G7 should operate. And you, you see of good practice from 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 past presidencies in recent in, in recent years. Um, you know, the, the the role of the G7 is to, as you say, um, set an agenda to act as a force for good and to try to see where it can lean in and help. And you also mentioned the importance of democratic values. And I just wanted to sort of slightly diverge from my script to say that this is clearly, this is one of the prime minister's clear priorities to recognize um, what it is about um, the G7 as open societies that marks us out um, as having something to offer to the rest of the world. And you'll see this also through, there is an open societies working group that'll be part of the summit um, but that also includes the invited guest countries. So India, Australia, the Republic of Korea and South Africa will all be contributing to that and broadening out um, the relevance of, of our presidency. So having kind of set the tone, set the, 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 the overall context, and let me just first of all be absolutely clear that creating good quality, decent jobs is central to our presidency and agenda. And I'm, I know you've heard from two secretaries of state, so you've probably heard a bit about Domestically, the government's plan for jobs and how it's focusing on helping recently unemployed people, particularly through the through the um, through the coronavirus um, pandemic, swiftly find new work or to retrain um, to provide greater support for those who are who are finding that journey particularly difficult. And longer term, our plan for growth, which is looking at creating high quality jobs for the future across the whole of the UK. Um, so I won't go on too much about that. But it is worth reflecting that we've picked up this G7 presidency at a critical time and we are committed to using this opportunity to help not only the world tackle coronavirus, but to use the phrase that Pierre referenced a few times, build back better so that we can create a greener, more prosperous future. And I think one of the core roles of our presidency is to focus on how we can coordinate this work internationally with our partners in the G7, with invited guests, thinking about, to answer your question for who, how do we, how do, we do that in a way that includes a fundamental, um, this concept of leveling up. So no person, no group, no geographic region, no ec economic sector is left behind. And it's worth also just thinking that this, is, this should include partnership with developing country, par developing country partners so that um, this is a, a journey that we all go on together. And I'll talk a bit more about this in a minute. So as I say, we're really grateful to the L7, not only for your contribution to this agenda, but also for coordinating the views of other engagement groups, um, including the, the Women's Seven, Youth Seven, and Business Seven, so that we can pick up on this important theme of building back of jobs, and in particular, the contribution that you've made through the G7 Employment Task Force, which has met twice under the UK presidency and will report directly to Sherpas and then to leaders at the summit. And I know that the task force members have met with the ILO, with the OECD, with the engagement groups, including L7, with a view to discussing a discussion um, on, to, to, to preparing a discussion on preparing the labor market for 2030 in a way that ensures everyone benefits. And this is um, an, something that leaders will be considering explicitly at the summit in Colvis Bay. And from, from the feedback that we've had from the task force, we they noted a strong unity of focus amongst engagement groups um, and a high level of optimism that we genuinely have an opportunity here to build back collectively so that we have a better, uh, fairer, um, greener economy to create more inclusive and greener labor markets as we recover from the impact of COVID and recognizing in particular the importance of lifelong learning and the availability of good quality work. So protecting and creating those jobs remains the highest priority for each of those um, members of the G7 domestically, but it's also fundamentally important that the international community continues to provide support for vulnerable co countries through, through this crisis and seeks to prevent further deterioration of already serious health, economic and social fragilities. And this is another point, Pierre, that you, that you raised. So as part of this, we're committed to global equitable access to vaccines, and as a G7, we've already committed over $7.5 billion to ACT A, the WHO initiative, including the COVAX facility. And we know that COVID-19 has had a disproportionate impact on women and girls, including through increasing the burden of unpaid care work. And so it's vital that we look at this. 
And we've also been listening carefully to G7 partners and external stakeholders who've been engaging with us on equality, in particular thinking about racial equality as a core building block of the recovery and our approach both to building back better and to leveling up as part of the future employment agenda. And you also mentioned, Pierre, the importance of social protection, affordable and quality care services, and recovery plans that will focus on protecting, supporting, and creating decent jobs and equal opportunities. And again, this is a message that's come through loud and clear. I'd also like to pick up on climate as a key theme and vital component of this agenda. So we're really pleased to hear that the L7 shares our priorities on tackling climate change and protecting the planet while ensuring prosperity. And it's a, it's a message that we've had over the last few years, we've had to sort of hammer home sometimes that protecting the planet and protecting prosperity should be hand in hand. They don't need to be in competition with each other. This is something that if we do it right, we'll be able to work together um, in, in concert and in lockstep. And part of our ambitious climate agenda is to cut emissions to net zero, to keep the goal of limiting temperature rise to 1.5 degrees within reach, to bend the curve of biodiversity loss by 2030 so that we're no longer losing species and habitats and environments um, by that date. And this is a particular personal priority for the Prime Minister. To mobilize and green finance and to create new green jobs. And again, domestically in the UK, the recent spending review committed 12 million pounds on measures to take forward the 10 point plan to support green jobs and to accelerate the path to net zero. And we know that investing in this will support up to 60,000 jobs in offshore wind, 50,000 jobs in carbon capture and storage, and up to 8,000 jobs in hydrogen in, in various industrial clusters. So this is, uh, in, this is putting this idea of, um, of uh, planet and, and um, prosperity going hand in hand into practice recognizing also that as we do that, we have to ensure that these sectors have diverse workforces, they draw upon a wide range of experiences and skill sets, and that we make sure that, that uh, the opportunity that that brings is broad-based. So next steps. First of all, it goes without saying, but I'll say it anyway, we're really looking forward to receiving the L7 Group's recommendations ahead of the Leaders' Summit in June. Um, I've mentioned my role in um, in the Sherpa team on the G20. And clearly there's a huge opportunity for us um, working in partnership as G7 presidency with our Italian um, colleagues in the G20 presidency and the overlap that we have as, as um, partners in delivering um, and co-hosting COP26 this year, which allows for a huge amount of, um, of, of join up synergy sequencing alignment. So that's uh, an opportunity that we're really looking forward to and finally, one more point I'd just like to make is that this is a whole of year presidency. So the summit takes place in June in Cornwall, but that's not the end of the story. We'll continue to be working throughout um, the year following on from the Leader Summit with a number of ministerials continuing to work, but further opportunities for us to continue to engage, including with the L7 beyond that. So we look forward to continuing to work with you. And once again, thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak today. Well, thank you so much and thanks not just for the substance of what you said but the spirit in which you said it and uh, we really look forward to continuing to work with you in, uh, in the weeks and months and years ahead. Uh, just a few closing remarks from me because it was great to hear both our speakers talking about the importance of flourishing democracy and I think we've learned a lot uh, not least from countries like the United States, Brazil, India, about the difference between a democracy that is flourishing and one that is not. And it goes without saying that it's important that we get the economic foundations right for that. We know how democracies are under more pressure, the more inequality grows. But it's also, I think, about the political class recognizing that it can't do it on its own. A thriving civic society and trade union movement is key to keeping democracy strong. It was also great to hear people reflecting on the lessons from the pandemic because there are so many practical lessons about what it takes uh, to keep people not only at work but safe at work, uh, what it takes to keep communities um, thriving too. 
Um, and I guess for each of us, uh, recognising that many people have lost loved ones or seen them fall to long COVID, that, you know, for many of us have had to question our own values, that it, it's not just about looking after our families, we have to look after our neighbours and our workmates too. So perhaps, you know, that, that uh, rise of nationalism we've seen in recent times, I think we've all learned the limits of that and the importance on the contrary of solidarity and the need for a new internationalism that looks for a fairer, greener work. And I guess I'd end with this, that, um, you know, we can all argue about who came up with the slogan, build back better first. Uh, personally, I would amend it to build back fairer. But what I do know is that that slogan has got to mean something real. It's got to be tested against reality. So it's got to mean something for the care workers and all our key workers who we saw under such pressure through the pandemic, who didn't even have the proper PPE, who very often were on zero hours contracts and almost all on very low pay, mainly women, often migrant workers too. Build Back Better has got to mean more respect for them. Build Back Better has got to mean something for the young black and ethnic minority people I was listening to who are unemployed or on furlough, really worried about their future, really worried about the impact that continuing racism has on the life chances of communities. And of course, older workers too, let alone working women who we know have shoulders uh, the bulk of the responsibilities during this crisis. And of course, it has got to mean, Build Back Better has got to mean something for the whole planet um, and tackling climate change in a way that achieves the just transition we all want to see. I think, uh, you know, we have taken a lot of us inspiration from the programme that President Biden has set out proving that another way is possible, that it is possible for working people to have decent work that gives everyone dignity and security, enough money to raise families, enough time to spend with loved ones. So it is possible. Let's get to it. Let's organise and let's stick together and stay strong. Solidarity, everybody.